I have the privilege this morning of talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that's relationship. Uh, so today, um, we're, we're, as we continue our, our looking at David, one of the things that I want to talk about is, is David's might and his mighty men. Now, I've been watching, um, I am, um, as part of my extended family, I have several people in our family that are very um, uh, attached to the Marvel comic universe. And uh, I've been watching as there are this, there's this uh, thing about, about superheroes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. When I was growing up, they were just a handful, and now I can't count them up. And I was thinking back to, uh, I'm, I grew up in the time where Saturday mornings on TV were cartoons. If you are as old as me, you'll remember that. And one of my favorites was Mighty Mouse. And I don't know if you remember Mighty Mouse, but Mighty Mouse is here to save the day. Da, 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 you know, and the enemies are all on their way out or whatever. Anyways, what I want to say is that this morning that there is a bunch of stories about this group of men that were known as the mighty men and how God used a small group of men, ordinary people, to do extraordinary things. So if you would, turn with me. Um, we're going to keep going through this. And the next slide, it says, from useless to useful. When I think in terms of who we are as a local church, uh, we don't have government uh, officials or military uh, generals or doctors and lawyers and whatever. Uh, we, we, at this juncture of our development, we just are a group of people that, got, that love Jesus and that God is in the process of helping us to make a difference around the world. Now, one of the things that you may or may not know, and again, when Andrea shared about being in the Philippines, those of us who were on face, Facebook, we were praying for you. We were watching what you're doing. So when anyone from our congregation goes someplace, that's us going someplace. And so for a church our size, we consistently punch above our weight class about the things that we do. And uh, when we went to Europe you know, this summer or this fall, again, that we had an opportunity to touch, I think, 10 different nations because there were missionaries from 10 different European nations. And, you know, we sent out uh, cards to the kids at Christmas and, and all of those things. And so what happens is people are saying that church cares for us. You know, when I was in Brazil and because I was there, you were there. So I want you to know something that these are not just a bunch of, of first round draft choices that were these mighty men. So turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. So if, you're, if you don't know much about sports, that's okay. Because in, in, in sports, what happens is that um, there's all of these really good players, regardless of whether they play football or lacrosse or hockey or whatever, that they scout them all out. And what they do is then they rank them and everybody wants the first rounder. Everybody wants them. Like, you know, and I was watching before the NHL shut down and I was watching Connor McDavid. And I remember when he was being drafted, they were saying he was a once in a generation player. And so again, everybody's saying, oh man, in fact, some teams, they'll even tank, they'll lose because the, the, the weaker your, your record is, the higher up in the draft choice you get. So there are actually teams who will spend a whole season tanking, losing on purpose to get the coveted number one. Well, here's what the demographics are of this group of mighty men. So look with me, 1 Samuel 22, verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. Now I want to stop there. Remember when we looked at David and Goliath, David as the youngest of, of, of uh, seven brothers, who were all big strapping number one choices, you know, and Samuel looked at him and says, oh man, surely God has chosen him. And says, God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. And then he says, is there somebody else? He says, oh yeah, there's the youngest and he's out taking care of the sheep. Well, bring him in here. And God says, that's my choice. So it's interesting that his brothers were really hard on him in 1 Samuel 17 when he came and he says, I'll fight the giant. And here they are when David is, is running from Saul. Remember Saul was, was out to get him. This is when they, they heard, they, they went down to him there. That shows that 
somehow, somewhere, some way that David was able to demonstrate by his character and his leadership that he was a man that was worth not only supporting, but following. Now, here's the next part. It says, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. I was thinking about that, that these were not millionaires. These were not government officials. They were, these were not really influential people. But what it said is, is that they heard about what was going on for David. David was standing up for right. David was used by God. He was willing to go where no man was willing to go. He took on the giant and he became Saul's right-hand man until Saul became jealous. But here is it says, and all those who were distressed. When I think in terms of church, I think that, I don't know, and I want to be very careful how I say this, but we often pray for stability. But what I've observed is during times of stability, men and women tend to forget God and tend to depend upon their own abilities. Would you agree with me with that? You know, like, hey, it's easy. You know, I don't have to worry about it. But all of a sudden, when the world becomes unsettled and they are in distress, I, there's one of my favorite passages of scripture in, in Genesis. It says, and when the world was falling apart, it says, then did men and women begin to call upon the name of the Lord. I think there's an opportunity here right now during this COVID-19 crisis. There's an opportunity. People are distressed. So it says these people were distressed. Isn't it interesting? And I think I'll go to this because it's crackling again. I'll do my Danny Jones invitation. Here we go. <laughs> and it's, then it says, it says they were distressed or in debt. And, you know, as we think in terms of things that, that the economic situation is, there's fairly few things that will dissettle people more than economics. But I can tell you that the, the word of God tells us that the kingdom of God and his economy is not tied to the economy of this world. That we see example after example after example about how God is not bound by the, the stock market on either side of the 49th parallel or the world. That he is our provider and he is our source. So when people were in debt and they said, I don't know how I can get through this that they began to come together and God used them to make a difference. It says that they were discontented and they gathered around. And so what happened was, what we see is this, this group of fighting men, we see that God took them from being people that the world had given up on, people who were marginalized, people who were seemingly weak, and this 400 men became 600, and they became one of the most elite, strong impactful fighting forces the world has ever known. So as we go through this, that um, I asked myself this question, why did David's mighty men believe in them? Now, this is a leadership lesson, and some of you are in positions of leadership over people in your work and your place of employment. But remember, we also said that every single one of you is a leader, even if you are a leader of one. And so here we see, says, so here are these guys that they were willing to lay down their life for David. Why was that? Well, the next slide gives us the answer. The reason why David's mighty men loved him is because he loved them and he believed in them. Now, as we think in terms of 2020, though it has come off to a, a, a rough start from the world's point of view, we came into 2020 saying, this is our Kairos moment. You know, and when we think in terms of Kairos has to do with a Greek word that says it is an appointed time. And again, one of my heroes, I don't agree with everything that he did and said, but Winston Churchill in the midst of World War II that he became a lightning rod for hope and for perseverance. And, you know, with I've heard the speech, and he says, we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall never surrender. And so they stood together. But what happened was David, 
men loved him because he loved them. And when you see, when I look through the scriptures, he was like the one that was right at the front of the battle. He was leading the charge. He led the charge of being a man of prayer. He was on his knees. I, I could see he was writing poetry and he was writing psalms. And can you imagine, here's this guy who knew his way around a battlefield, but his men would see him on his knees or on his face or with his harp just playing and singing songs of worship. And it was transforming him. He was a man they could look up to. They loved him because he loved them and he believed in them. One of the stories in, in uh, these mighty men, so they were, they were in a situation, and David, in a, he says, oh, I'm just so thirsty. Oh, that I could have a drink from the spring of Bethlehem. And three of these guys, they said, David wants it. We'll go get it. And so these three guys, they fought their way in. They went to the spring there in Bethlehem, and they brought him back water. says, here, David, you asked for water from the spring of Bethlehem, and here it is. Now you can say, well, that's ridiculous. But you see, it shows something of the great honor and, and love that they had for him. And so David did something that is totally counterintuitive. Instead of saying, wow, that's just what I'm looking for. And he guzzled it down. The Bible says that he took that water and he poured it out on, onto the ground as an offering to the Lord. It says, this is the blood of these men. And, and so instead of him quenching his physical thirst, he said, I recognize the incredible sacrifice that you meant. That's the kind of people these guys were. The next thing is that they became this incredible united force. They shared equally in the victories. And so in 1 Samuel 30, verse 24, and David, when he was running from Saul, that they went on these raiding parties. And it says that there were 600 of them at this point. 200 of them were so weary that they couldn't go out to battle and they stayed behind with the baggage. And so the 400 went out and they won the battle. They, they were able to restore what had been taken from them. And so basically they came back and they were saying, well, these guys, they just stayed with the baggage. We're the ones who put our lives on the line. And David stood up and he said, look, those who stay with the baggage will share equally in the spoils of those who actually went into battle. And he said it became a statute. Now, what does that look like about us as a church? What's the application? So the application is when people from our congregation, from our church, when we stay behind, we give and we pray. Then there are those like Andrew who was in the Philippines or like when I went to Brazil or when we went to Europe. When we have people who go out and, and they are someplace or at Mercy or in Kedemat, when they are out in the battlefield, those of us who are still here, we share equal. Why? Because we're a team. And we have each other's back. And so what I did is I was reading through the story of David before, from the time he started to run from Saul and when the time he became the king. And over and over and over again, I took my green marker and my other Bible at home. And it says, and David's mighty men were with him. And David's mighty men were with him. And David's mighty men were with him. And together the mighty men and David did this and this and this and this. And so you know what? I want you to believe, I still with all of my heart believe the best years of our local church are in front of us. And, you know, again, when I'm very touched when some of our, our old soldiers, both male and female, go home to be with Jesus. And I looked at that picture of Jack, and, you know, he was not only a, a, a veteran of World War II, but he was, a, he was a warrior. He served on our church council. He and his wife, Margaret, they, they hosted a home group for 30 years. And he was here, and even when he could just barely walk in here, you know, it was kind of like, you know, in the, the old Cheers thing, when they walked in, when, when Norm walked into Cheers, and everybody said, Norm! When Jack would walk in, everybody say, Jack! Why? Because... We care. And so his example, he was a mighty man because he stood. So they, they were together. And so what happens is that they understood that they could accomplish more together than they could alone. Now, if you forget everything else that I've said, I'd like you to hang on that one. That we need to remember that when we stand together, we can accomplish more than we can by ourselves. The enemy wants for you to think that you are useless and worthless and you are not a person of privilege or you're not a person of great influence or great financial resources. But the reality is because you breathe, because you are a child of God, that God is saying he does not make 
people worthless, but he takes what the world has done to make people feel that way, and he elevates them, and you are part of his finest fighting force to make a difference where he rules that we can stand for heaven's best. Can you say amen or something on that? Now, I want to get some go to specific things here. In 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 23, verses 8 to 39, I'm just going to hit the highlights. So if you think you think Infinity War was amazing, and if you think Endgame was awesome with Iron Man saying, I am Iron Man. When you read these guys, these guys are, they were doing supernatural, super, superhuman things, not because of technology or they had some special grace upon their life from some sort of parentage or demigods or whatever the Marvel Universe, how they empower people. But these were men who just believed that as they were doing what God wanted them to do, they could do made many mighty exploits. And I want you to know something. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your sex is or your gender. I don't care whether you're rich or poor. I don't care whether you're strong or weaker. I want you to know something. As long as you have breath, that God is calling you to join in God's army, his mighty men. Now, here's a few of them. One guy, his name is Joshua Bathsheba. And it says that he raised his spear against 800 men and prevailed. Now, I don't can you can think about this. Here is this guy. He raises his spear against 800 men and he prevails. And so it's kind of like, you know, we saw Jonathan. If you read through the story that Jonathan and his armor bear, the rest of the armies of Israel, they're all hiding because they're afraid of the Philistines. And Jonathan says, let's go up and let's take those guys out. They're blaspheming against them in the name of the Lord. And the armor bearer says, okay, man, if you're going up, I'm going up too. And so he says, if they say, come on up, that means God has given us them into our hands. And so they're up there and the Philistines are looking and saying, look at those Hebrews. They're crawling on their hands and knees. We're going to just, you know, feed them to the birds of the air. And Jonathan says, yes, we got them just where we want them. And they went up. And so Jonathan is, you know, cutting them down here and the, the armor bearer is finishing the job. And they go up this thing and they win a great victory. And because they did that, the rest of the people were encouraged and they stormed the gates and they won. Maybe you're a Jonathan or maybe you're the armor bearer, but the, together they could accomplish more than they could by themselves. Another guy, it says it was a guy by the name of Eleazar, and it says, and the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground. And, you know, again, I've, I've seen some documentaries on, on, on D-Day, and uh, I'm just totally amazed that those young men, that they were in those, those landing craft, and they knew that the chances, especially if they were the first ones off those landing craft, that their chances of survival were zero or less. And they went anyways. And I've seen pictures of where the, the, the people were hunkered down on the, on the, on the beach and, and things were stacking up and the bullets were flying and the shells were being fired. And it says that there were people who got up and they grabbed people and says, come on, we've got to move forward. Come on, get up. We've got to go on. Come on, get up. We've got to go on. And I want you to know Satan wants you to think that you are defeated and you are pinned down on the beach of life. And the bullets are flying and the guns are roaring and the machine guns are shooting and you're there and you're paralyzed by fear. But somebody someplace gets up and says, the battle belongs to the Lord. And so I want you to know something that I've lived in discouragement and I've lived in fear and it isn't fun. And it changes nothing. But what changes things is where I trust that we can get up from feeling like we're pinned down and we press forward. Now, the next one is, there's a guy by the name of Shammah says he took his stand in the middle of a field. And there's one other place that says that in the middle of a bean field. And so I don't know about you. Have you ever felt that God has placed you in some obscure bean field and says, I want you to hold this piece of ground? It's like, but, but nobody sees me. But, 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 you know, it looks like the battle's over there. And God is saying, I have called you to stand in the middle of this bean field, and I'm calling you to take a stand. So I want you to know something. 
I want to encourage you. Not one single person in this building right now are those who are called Sunshine Hills Church. Not one single person in this room is not called to greatness. Not one single person in this place is called to hunker down and be afraid and be pinned down by the assaults of the evil. Well, not one of us, even if God is saying, I want you to stand in the middle of this bean field and it seems like it doesn't matter to anything. If God's calling you to stand in the bean field, stand and fight. Stand and fight. We don't know why, but he does. Or this other one, there's a guy by the name of Beniah, and it says that he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Now, I thought about that, and I thought, that's just goofy. So think about this. It's snowing, and he jumps into this pit with a wild lion, and he slays this lion. And, and, and I thought to myself, I was laying in bed last night, I was thinking about this. I said, God, what's going on there? So we know that God doesn't do anything that doesn't have a purpose. So I thought to myself, well, was he trying to prove to people how tough he was? Yeah, I'm tough. I'll go in there. But it occurred to me that if there was a pit and the lion was in there, it was because it was a trap because that lion was a threat. If he went in there, that lion was in there. It was, he was a threat. And so Benaiah says, I'll go. So first of all, I don't know about you. I'm not so keen on jumping into a pit with a, with, a, with a lion. And certainly not in a snowy day because he's got four-wheel drive and I've only got front-wheel drive. And he jumps in there and he slays that lion. You may be called to jump into a pit someday to slay a giant, a lion, or you may be called to pick up a few stones and stand against a giant that's almost 10 feet tall. But if God is for you, who can be against you? Now, can you, like, and I, I like to make these little movies to me. Can you see that this would rival anything in the Marvel universe? These guys are awesome. And then if you read through the rest of 1 Samuel 22, you'll see all these names and names and names. And I was thinking about this. I don't know. Uh, my dad uh, instilled in me a respect for graveyards. Not because somehow, you know, he, it was morbid or whatever, but we would walk in the graveyards, and especially old ones. And he would say, Tom, come over here. And we would read some, some name, and there would be some epitaph. And sometimes you knew what they did. And most of the time, they were just a name crawl, carved on a piece of stone or granite. But what happens is, is that, that we have the mighty men list. We don't know a lot about all of them, but they were counted as being part of this amazing group of people. My dad used to say that a lot more would be done for the kingdom of God if we weren't so concerned about who's going to get the credit. These guys made a difference. And because they made a difference and supported David, these mighty men influenced every single one of us that are sitting in this room today. Thousands of years before, before us, these guys made a difference because they were willing to stand and support and fight and believe and trust and make a difference. What's the lessons? Loyalty is born of mutual respect and trust. One of the things that I'm, and this is a whole sermon in and of itself, but one of the things that I see that is constantly at risk in any group of people is trust. Can I trust that person who's standing next to me? Can I trust that they'll have my back? Can I trust that they will not shoot me from the back? But loyalty is born of mutual trust and respect. And so when we learn to fight together, not fight with each other, but fight together against the common enemy, we begin to learn to trust. We can say, you know what? I can trust that when things get tough, I can pick up the phone and I can call. When things are difficult, I can ask for prayer. When things are difficult, I can come to the people who stand at the front and who love to pray with people. I can do that too. We can accomplish more together than we can by ourselves. I sometimes forget that. <laughs> My instinctive response to a challenge is work harder. 
What more can I do? And there are times when, like Jehoshaphat, where we have to come flat on our face and say, Lord, the enemies are against us. We are powerless against them, but our eyes are on you. And finally, God restores, and we can become more than we were. So I close with this. I want to make sure, and this is the hook for today, is that God has a plan for every single person's life in this, in this place. Whether you were born in a church or whether you've just started to come, whether you, you feel that you've got talents or whether you feel that you're behind the door when talents were being t- passed out. I want you to know that God doesn't make junk. And God has a plan for each one of you. And God has a plan for us. And it has nothing to do with how many people are here. It has to do with how much we trust God and how much we will stand and fight and stand for what's right. Close with this last thing and then I'm done. Uh, We had an opportunity once upon a time, Lottie and I, to to work with young people. I know it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And there was this one young lady and by human standards, she, 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 she just felt so worthless, and she wasn't. She felt she wasn't pretty. She felt that people didn't like her, and I'll never forget this. It was uh, at, at Camp Crescent Beach, and and she she was just out. It was a rainstorm. It was about middle of the camp, and she was just laying out on the on the picnic table, and she was just crying her eyes out. And we, as leaders, we went and we looked, and we said, you know. Do we, go, do we go and pray with her? And we just all had this check in our spirits that God was doing something in her life. So she was out there for the longest of time. Seemed like hours. It was probably minutes. And then she came in and she had this big smile on her face. And we said, are you okay? And she says, yeah, I'm more than okay. Says, I was laying on that picnic table and feeling like a failure and that I wasn't pretty enough and I wasn't smart enough and I wasn't kind enough and I wasn't a good enough friend and that I had nobody to care for me. And God spoke to me and, and, and called, her, called me by name and he said, I don't make junk. I don't make junk. God has a plan for your life. Let's close our eyes. This morning, again, if you're here and this is your first time here or countless times I, I do this even when I know everybody in the room. Maybe you're here and you've never made a personal decision to receive Jesus as your Savior. You know about God and maybe you've been here lots of times or whatever, but just you've never just really raised your hand in a place like this and acknowledged and says, yes, I am now uh, receiving Jesus as my Savior. He died for me. He has a plan for my life. And I want to receive him into my life. Is there anybody like that? Raise your hand. I'd love a chance to pray with you. Anybody? Okay. Is there anybody here that would just say, you know, Pastor, this really spoke to me. I feel often useless. But I just want to just change that narrative. I want to change that story. Would you pray for me? I want to be able to embrace the truth that God has a plan and he has called me to be a part of his mighty people to do the things that I'm asked to do. Is there anybody like that? Would you just say, I would really like to have prayer. Yeah, I see that hand. Anybody else? Yeah, I see that one and that one. Anybody else? Yeah, that one too. Anybody else? Okay, Lord, we are here and we just pray for these that have raised their hands. Lord, we stand upon the truth. It says that just as those men, and they sought out, they sought out David. Lord, these are people who are seeking out you, Jesus, and they're saying, I want to be on your team. Lord, just meet them, show them how you have a plan and a calling on their life and that they can do things that they cannot do when they stand in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Will you stand with me, please? <clears throat> Again, there are people who love to pray. And if you're one of those people who loves to pray for people, you can just be down here. And if, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you have to have this big problem. Maybe you just need to affirm something that God spoke to you today. Just, and again, they're going to stand there and pray for you, but I just want to bless you with the realization that as God is for us, who can be against us? Go, let's make a difference. Amen.